Uh, dear Father in heaven, we thank you for an opportunity to talk about you, to examine your beauty, and to explore the topics that, that we have before us tonight. And I pray that as we do so, that your Holy Spirit would be here with us, that you would be guiding us, teaching us, um, helping us to understand the, the Bible in a clearer way. And Lord, help us to, to understand your love in a clearer way as well. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay. So to begin with, I want to share with you a little story. Okay. So here's a picture of me on a, doing, running a half marathon. Now I had this idea to run this half marathon about, I did this, I think it was about four years ago now, and I didn't really put a whole lot of thought into it, and I just thought, alright, that sounds like a good, a good challenge to do. Um, let's embrace it and give it a go. Now, my biggest mistake was that I didn't really train for this. Okay? And my, my plan for my training was I had joined this running group. And you've got on your seats uh, these community groups, we have community groups brochure that you've got there. And this has a whole range of different interest groups and hobby groups. What I joined was basically one of those types of things. It was a running group. And I thought, if I join this running group, and it was nine weeks long, by the end of it, I should be all ready to run this half marathon. But the problem was, the running group wasn't really designed to prepare for that sort of a race. And the other problem was, I missed almost half of the, the, the group meets, and so um, I really only had a few runs before this, this half marathon, and I was very, very under-trained um, for the race. And so it got, it got time for the, the beginning of the race and we went up to the, the Gold Coast. So I had three other friends that I was, I was running with and it was 6 a.m., it was a very cold morning and we're ready to take on the Gold Coast Half Marathon. Now I had a goal. My goal was to run this, this race in five-minute kilometres. And that means every kilometre you're doing it in under five minutes. Um, I had, I, I'd been able to run shorter distances at that speed, so I thought oh, I'll just try and continue that right through. The other thing that I thought, I'll, I'll try running with one of my good friends. He was a much better runner than me, and I thought if I try and keep up with him, then that'll really push me, and hopefully I'll, get, I'll finish faster. And so the, the race began, and I had a little uh, GPS watch on, and that would give me updates on my speed and my pace all the way through. First kilometre, under five minutes. Yes, I'm on track. Second kilometre, third kilometre, fourth kilometre, fifth kilometre, all under five minutes, each one. And I was really excited about... Um, how this race was coming and I was reaching my goals. And this continued on until I got to kilometre number 10. And, as, and 10 was, was the halfway point and there was a, you turn around and you start uh, coming back the other direction. And I suddenly re came to this realisation that I'd done this com race completely wrong. And the other realisation was I, there was no way I was going to be able to continue this pace all the way to the end. And my friend that I was running with, he started getting a bit further in front of me, a bit further in front of me. And um, I remember actually at the end, as I was going home afterwards, I texted Kylie and she's like, how was the race? And I said, the first half was excellent and the second half, I just wanted to cry the whole time. <laughs> and it was seriously one of the most exhausting, painful things that I've done. And I remember as I got to the end, I was just so exhausted. My running had basically, it was more, it was more like walking um, than running by the end. I was just, my feet were hurting, my legs were hurting and I wanted so desperately to give up. And the only thing that kept me going was, as I looked to the side, and there was all these spectators on either side of the, of the course, and the last sort of kilometre, and I just knew if I stopped, they would just yell at me until I got going again. So I just stumbled across the, the line at the end there, and here's one of the, the pictures. And you can see I look pretty exhausted. And I remember at the end there was this big um, tub of oranges. And I was just so hungry at the end. I remember just dove into those oranges. I just picked up these handfuls. And I, I was, it was almost uncontrollable. I was just like shoving in my mouth. had orange juice all over my face. I was just um, so exhausted. Now, why am I sharing this story with you? I'm sharing this because often life feels a little bit like this experience that I had with the race. Often when you ask people, how's your week been? The response, at least my experience is, People always say, busy, 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 everyone's busy. When people ask me, I often respond with the same thing. I've been busy. Life just seems to get so busy all of the time. Um, and often our bodies are telling us, just like in that, in that race, my body was telling me, Jared, slow down, slow down, slow down, stop running. 
And I actually injured my foot in the race as well, and I was hobbling along for, around for the next few days. Um, my body was telling me to stop, but the external pressures just were, were convincing me to continue and to keep pushing forward. Um, and often in life, our bodies are telling us that we need to stop, we need to have a break. But the pressures around us, whether they're financial pressures, whether they're um, just family pressures, whatever they are, convince us to keep pushing through, um, regardless of the cost. But the reality is that the busyness of life does come with a cost. I want to share with you a couple of the areas that I think that continual weariness and busyness uh, begins to impact upon our lives. Firstly, it impacts upon our health. If we're, if we're not getting enough sleep, we're stressed, we're worried, it starts to really impact upon our health. Secondly, it starts to impact upon our relationships. Relationships require time and investment, and when we get really busy, that time that we spend with those that are closest to us gets smaller and smaller, and they actually start to, the health of those relationships starts to decrease. Another area where the busyness of life starts to interrupt is our spiritual life. We, we start getting too busy to pray, too busy to, to connect with God, too busy to, to pursue spiritual things, and pretty soon we find ourselves feeling much more distant from God as well. And so the, the question that we're examining, that we're looking at tonight is, is there an answer to all of the busyness of life? And I want to share with you from the beginning that there is good news, and that is that God wants to give us rest. Uh, a promise in Scripture that is one of my favorites uh, goes like this. It's found in the Bible in the book of Matthew. And it says, this is Jesus speaking here. It says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Isn't that a beautiful promise? For anyone who's, who's struggling with the continual weariness of life, God wants to give us rest. And the rest that God wants to give us is not just physical rest from the physical burdens of life, but we don't just get physically weary, but we get, we, get, um, we get worn out emotionally. We get worn out if we're struggling with, with guilt, uh, the, the weariness of dissatisfaction with life. Whatever the weariness is, God wants to give us rest. And I love the following verse. It goes on to say, you will find rest for your souls. Okay, that's a deeper rest than just having a, a nice um, night's sleep. This is that, that deep abiding rest that God wants, wants to give us. So how does God give us this rest? Well, I want to look at tonight two gifts that God has given us to help us to experience the rest that he wants, he wants us to experience. Okay? And the first one of these is the gift of prayer. Okay? The gift of prayer. Um, God has given us prayer as a way for us to experience his rest. Now what do I mean by that? Let me read to you another promise in Scripture, and this is found in Philippians chapter 4, and it describes the rest that we can get as a result of, of prayer. It says, don't worry about anything. Is that an easy instruction to, to apply to your life? What would your life be like if you could eliminate worry? It would be a completely different life for, for many of us if we could eliminate worry. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Now, there could be someone here tonight that, um, that the concept of prayer is, I'm sure everyone has heard about prayer, but maybe you're not a praying person and you're confused as to how someone actually um, engages with prayer. The simplest way to understand prayer is, is, is simply talking to God just like you're talking to a friend. And just as when you talk to a friend, you open up your heart, you tell them about your highs and your lows and your struggles and, and all the things that are going on, God wants to hear these things from us as well. And so praying is just like talking to a friend. And so it says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And then it says, then you will experience God's peace, which, it, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And that's describing the rest that God wants to give us. That deep, um, satisfying peace that regardless of what's happening around us um, is with us at all times. And it's, and it's a real anchor to, to, the, to, the, to the heart. And so um, bring, bring your, your, your struggles to God um, and He will give you rest. He will give you that peace. Now what does this actually look like? Um, 
the person who's write, who wrote this uh, book, his name was Paul, and he's writing. It's called the Book of Philippians because he was writing to a group of people in a in a in a city called Philippi. Now, when Paul had actually gone to Philippi the first time, he found himself in a really difficult situation. In fact, he was beaten and and he was put up in put in prison, and he found himself his whole situation was had turned all upside down. But I want to read to you. The Bible describes this story. I want to realize, read to you what Paul was doing during this situation. So it says, after they had been, this is talking about Paul, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet to the stocks. Sounds like a hard place in which to experience rest and peace. But this is what, how Paul describes, this is what, how the story continues on. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. They're singing, they're singing songs in the middle of this, this terrible situation. That, that have such, they're praying to God, they're taking it to God and they're filled with such peace and rest that they're able to sing and, and, sing and praise and worship God in the midst of that. And the other prisoners are looking on thinking, what is this that is going on? How can these people have such peace and such joy in the midst of such hardship. And this is what God wants to do in our lives as well. And so the peace that God gives us is not just a peace because everything now is going well for us, but it's a peace that even when the world around us is crumbling apart, it's a peace that we can have even in those times as well. So why, um, so, so why does praying to God give us this peace? Well, when we, when we worry all the time, it's like this, this big weight upon our shoulders. But when we pray, what we do is we give all that worry, we give all that stress over to God, and He car- carries the weight of that responsibility. He carries the weight of all that worry as well. And remember, as we've been talking about God through this series, God is the God of all places, all time, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God. Um, if He's carrying your problems, your burdens, then you can have peace. Now, also, we need to remember that, that Jesus loves us so much. And if Jesus loves us enough to die on the cross for us, then we know we can trust him with all of our other problems as well. There's one other all that I want to add to our list, and that is found in Isaiah 40, verse 28. See, all of us fi- find ourselves in situations where we are weary and burdened and in need of rest, but God does not find himself in that situation. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And then it says, He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. So unlike us, God never grows tired and He never grows weary. So He's the God of, here's the other all, He's the God of all energy. Okay? The God of all energy. Uh, Prayer is a beautiful gift that enables us to experience God's rest in the midst of the busyness of life. So there's gift number one. Um, God has given us prayer. Now, the second gift that I'm going to share with you um, might be a new one for some of you. And in fact, it's probably one of the more neglected gifts of, of the Bible. As you read through, script, through Scripture, as you read through the Bible, there's many things that God has given us. But this is one that often people um, these days tend to neglect, which is interesting because... This gift is talked about in the Bible all the way through, right from Genesis, and we see it um, referred to even all the way through to Revelation as well. And this gift is the gift of the Sabbath. Okay? Now you might be wondering, what on earth is the Sabbath all about? Well, I'm going to unpack this for you. And because there's some people here who the idea of, of, of a Sabbath is new, we're going to start right at the beginning of the first time we see in the Bible it talking about uh, the Sabbath. But I want to share with you that, um, that God has given us the Sabbath as a gift to counteract the, the side effects of all of, of the busyness of life. Uh, it's, it's something that's in, it's supposed to enhance our, our, our health, our relationships with one another, and also en- enhance our, our, our spiritual life as well. So let's go to the first time that we see the Sabbath in, in the Bible. Okay? So... In the fir- very first book of the, uh, book of the Bible, in Genesis, in the first chapter, it describes God creating the world. And as you read through um, the this, this story, it describes God creating the world in six days. And, I, and 
It's a fairly long chapter, so I'm not going to read all of it to you um, tonight. But I'll just summarize Genesis chapter 1 for you. So on day one, we see God um, creating the heavens and the earth, and he creates light, and he, and he separates the day from the night. Day two, he, separates, he creates the expanse above us, and so we see the creation of sky and the ocean. On day three, we see uh, God creates the land and the vegetation. Day four, he fills uh, the, the, the heavens with the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, he fills the, 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 the sky and the ocean with the birds and the fish. And day six, he fills the, animal, he fills the, the earth with the, the great climactic work of his creation, and that is he creates the animals, and finally he creates people, human beings, the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. And so, um, and at the end of all this, God looks back and he looks at this, this new creation that he has made and he has this to say. It says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And it says, there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. So God has, in six days, created everything that we see around us. But his work was not finished. Even though his work of creating had finished, there was still something very important for him to do. And this we find on the seventh day. And it goes on to say, um, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. That's what we're talking about tonight, rest. God rested from all his work. And then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So here we see the introduction of the Sabbath. And here it's referred to as simply the seventh day. And I want to point out to you the three things that God did on the seventh day. And I've underlined them on the screen. Number one, God rested. Okay. Number two, God blessed the seventh day. And number three, God made the seventh day holy. Okay, here they are. It's, the seventh day is a rest day, a blessed day, and a holy day. And as we unpack the, the Sabbath, the idea of the Sabbath tonight, we're going to look, unpack these three different things, and we're going to look at what does it mean for a day to be a rest day, a blessed day, and a holy day. Okay, so let's start with number one, a rest day. Now, the idea of God resting should come to us as being a very unexpected thing. We just talked about how God is the God of all energy. Okay? He never grows weary or tired. But then in Genesis chapter 2, we saw that on the seventh day it says God rested. What is God doing resting at all? Um, what is the significance of this? And I'd like to suggest that when we, when we figure out the re answer to this question, we're actually going to really get to the heart of what the, sab what the Sabbath is all about. I'm going to give you a little bit of an illustration um, to help you understand the point I'm about to make. On the screen, you see a couple of big piles of dirt. And when I was uh, growing up, and I was sort of my teenage years, my brother and I used to love to create. And these are the sorts of things we used to like, love to create. We'd spend hours and days creating these big piles of dirt. Okay? We'd get the shovels out and, we'd, and the picks and and just digging, 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 sweating, it's super hot. Sometimes we'd get Dad's tractor out with the bucket on the front and we'd be digging these holes all across his paddock um, and making these big piles of dirt. And now, when we'd finish the work of creating these, these piles of dirt, we would have a rest. Okay? But the rest that we would have was not a rest of inactivity. Okay? But rather, the rest that we had was a rest from the activity of building all these piles of dirt in order to engage in a different activity. And this was the activity that we'd engage with. Okay? So here's a picture of me jumping over one of these piles of dirt. Um, and we used to just love riding the motorbikes around, um, around these, these motorbike tracks that we would create. Um, but the, the point is, when we'd finish creating, we'd put that work aside because it was now time for us to enjoy the thing that we had created. Those piles of dirt were not an end in themselves, but we were building them with a purpose. Okay? And that purpose was to create a really fun place to ride our, our motorbikes over. And so, um, so, so it was a rest from our one activity, and it was not a rest of inactivity, but it was in order to engage in something, something else. Now, the, the rest, uh, when God created the world, he wasn't just simply creating a whole bunch of really beautiful objects. Okay? 
But he, just as we had a purpose with creating these piles of dirt, God had a purpose with his creation. And, and God's purpose was he was wanting to create friends. Okay, that's, remember last, last week we were talking about how the, God's heart longs for connection. Okay? And, and that's the reason God was creating it all. He was, he was, building, he was creating this environment for, and then he was creating the birds and the fish and the, and the animals all building up to be this beautiful world for his, his, the first man and the first woman to, to live in. And when he finished, he then said, it's time now in order to put this work of creating aside in order to engage in the very act, the, it, the, engage with the thing that I was working towards. Okay? And that is simply enjoying that which he had created. God's purpose in creating the world was not to make really beautiful objects, but really beautiful friends. The Sabbath is a day when God puts his busyness aside to enjoy connecting with us. He's finished his purpose of creating and he, he now enters into his creation to enjoy fellowship, to enjoy friendship with, with the people he had created. I want to show you a, an interesting book on the screen. It's called the, the Five Love Languages. And the book is written by a person by the name of Gary Chapman. And the, book, the purpose of the book is to try to help people to understand the way that people give and receive love. And the, the whole premise of the book is that there are five ways that we show love and we receive love. Number one, uh, words of affirmation. Number two, acts of service. Number three, giving, receiving gifts. Number four, physical touch. And number five is quality time. And as I was reflecting on this, I realized that that God actually demonstrates his love towards us in all of these five different uh, love languages. And let me, demonstra- let me show you a few passages in Scripture where we see God showing his love to us through these various love languages. Words of affirmation. Here's a verse that we, we read on one of the previous sessions. Um, Jesus says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. Okay? I know my, my wife says to me, Jared, you're my, my best friend. Okay? It makes me feel really good. It's a way that she expresses her love to me. God expresses his love through words of affirmation. Number two, acts of service. Jesus says these words, Just as the Son of Man, that's referring to Jesus, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is saying that Jesus, his whole life here on this earth was, a, was, a, was in, an engagement in service, acts of service, and the greatest act of service was Jesus dying on the cross for us. Um, number three, giving and receiving gifts. In the book of Romans it says, For the wages of sin is death, death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. God, and throughout Scripture we see all these gifts that God is giving uh, to us. Physical touch. There's a, an awesome story that comes, came to my mind when I thought about physical touch where Jesus heals this leper. And if you think about a leper... Uh, leprosy was this contagious disease. Uh, people considered lepers as unclean and they didn't want to be anywhere near them. But when Jesus encountered a leper, he did this. It says, And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And it says, And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. Jesus didn't need to touch this person, but he wanted to demonstrate his love for this, this leper. And so he, he physically touched him in that moment. But what about quality time? How does God show his love th- for us through quality time? Well, the way that the book defines quality time is, un- is giving someone your undivided attention. Okay? Now, I don't know if you've ever had this experience when you're talking to someone and they're there like, nodding their head like they're listening, but you look in their eyes and you can see their, their mind is elsewhere. They're, they're looking around their room. They're thinking about other things. How does that make you feel? I hate it when people are doing that when I'm trying to talk. Like, just give me your undivided attention. Well, on the Sabbath, God gives us his undivided attention. Again, we read, by the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested. His rest was putting aside all of his work to give, put everything aside to give Adam and Eve, the first people, his undivided attention. So that's the rest day. That's what, when it says the Sabbath is a rest day, that's what it's talking about, a God who wants to spend time with us. What about a blessed day? 
what does it mean that God blessed the, the seventh day? Well, what does it mean to bless anything? I was trying to come up with the best definition I could come up with from looking at different dictionaries and things, and this is the best definition I could come up with, with what it means to bless. Okay? Uh, to bless means to make better or happier through the giving of good things. Okay? Um, maybe you can come up with a different definition. That's the best that I could um, come up with. Now, the awesome thing is that God loves to bless us. He loves to fill our lives with good things to make our lives better and make them happier. He's in the business of, of doing this. But the thing about God's blessing is that whenever, whenever God blesses something, it's always a contagious blessing. Now, when we think about the word contagious, we usually have a negative association with it. I remember my very first week in kindergarten, I had chicken pox. And so I, I missed my very first week. Well, it wasn't, I actually missed my whole first week of, of school. And when I got to school, everyone called me chicken pox boy. Okay? It was very, very difficult for me to... Uh, it was a bad start to school. Okay? But when I'm, when I'm talking about God's contagious blessing, I, want to mean, I mean in, in a very positive way. Okay? That when God blesses something, that blessing continues, begins to flow on to, to others as well. Let me give you an example of a contagious blessing. On the screen here, you see my first two cars that I ever had. On the left is, is a Nissan Skyline, and on the third is my little uh, Suzuki Grand Vitara. Okay? And I want to tell you a little story about, about these cars and how I came to get them. Um, but the story begins with my dad. So my dad is, is, a, is a doctor, and um, quite a number of years ago, the, biz, the surgery where he worked got taken over by a large medical company. And I don't know how much um, the, the um, owner of that business got but, uh, when this, this, medical, this surgery got taken over by this big company. But my dad's boss took all of the doctors out to, to dinner one night. And at the end of, end of that night, he said, OK, I want to come and show you guys something. And he walked out to the car park out the back. And there was this brand new Honda CRV, OK, this, this, brand, new, uh, this brand new Honda car, full drive. And, the, and my dad's boss looked at all the doctors and said, one for you, one for you, one for you, and one for you. And they were like, like, he literally gave all these people a brand new car. Okay? Now, at the time, my dad was, was um, planning to upgrade his car and to upgrade my mum's car. So he suddenly, because he had this, 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 all that money was now saved, because he'd just been given this car, um, the blessing began to flow on to others. And... I was looking for a, so the Skyline was my first car, and and it was pretty rough. It was getting pretty old, and so I was looking around for a new car. And I remember my dad one day after after school drove me to the the car dealer dealership. He said, "Oh, Jared, I, I want to show you this car. It's a little four wheel drive. I think I think you might be interested in. It might be what sort of car that you, you would like." I'm like, oh, "Okay." So I'm in the car, and we we go down to the car dealer, and this. The car that you see on the right was parked outside the, the dealership there. And um, Dad, we, we got out and I was thinking, why is this car out like on the, on the curbside and not actually in, the, in the, the main shop area? And Dad said, OK, here's the keys. Have a look inside. And I was like, why do you have the keys? And he's like, it's yours. And my dad gave me this car. And I was just like so amazed that God had given this. So you see the, the, this... The, the blessing is starting to flow on it. It's, it's being a contagious blessing here. Now, then it was time to sell my old Skyline. And one of my friends from school, his older brother was interested in this car. It wasn't worth a whole lot. It was probably a couple of thousand dollars. And so, he, so my friend's brother came out to look at it. He looked all over. He checked under the hood and everything. And eventually thought, I was like, yep, I want to buy it. So my dad and I walked inside to get some of the paperwork. And as we were, walking, we were inside, I said to Dad, Dad, why don't we just give this car to him? Um, you've got a free car. I've got a free car. Um, why don't we just give it away? And so we walked outside and looked my friend's brother in the eye and said, it's all yours for free. And he was just like, what do you mean? And he was just so amazed that he'd been given a free car. Contagious blessings. When God blesses something, it's like this. The blessing flows on and on and on. Let me give you an example from the Bible. In the Bible, uh, much of the old story is, is, is the story of a man by the name of Abraham and his descendants. And God, uh, when he first 
calls Abraham to, for this special task, God says that he's going to bless him. But he goes on to say, he says, Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Can you see the contagiousness of it there? God is going to bless him so then he can bless others. Now, how does, what does this have to do with, with the Sabbath? When God blesses a person, that person then becomes a fountain of blessing for all those people around them. When God blesses a day, that day now becomes a fountain of blessing for anyone that comes into contact with that day. Does that make sense? Let me share with you um, another passage in the Old Testament that talks about, um, and we're going to see the contagious nature of the, of, of the Sabbath day, of the rest that God wants to give us in this verse. So, uh, we're going to look now. We're going to look in the book of Exodus, and in the book of Exodus, we see the uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments. Okay, you might have heard of the Ten Commandments before. Basically, it's God's ten instructions on how we can live the happiest, best life possible. Okay, and right in the center of those Ten Commandments, He talks about the Sabbath day, and this is what He says. He says, "Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy." Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the Sabbath day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And so just as God kept this Sabbath day right back in the creation week and he put his rest uh, aside, God now invites us to partake in that rest as well. The, the blessing is to flow on into our lives as well. Now this is also showing that the Sabbath wasn't to be a one-off, once-off occasion back there on the creation week, but rather what God had established was this ongoing cycle of weeks. And you might be, you, you may have wondered where our, I don't know, some people have often wondered, where is the week, where did the week come from, the idea of a week? Okay, if you think about the, the year, the year comes from the time it takes for the earth to go around the sun. Think about a day, it's the time for the earth to spin on its axis. You think about a month, it has to do with the, 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 the moon in the sky. But what about a week? What is that based off? Well, the, 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 week that, the, the weekly cycle that we have traces its origin right back to the creation of the world that we read about there in, in Genesis. And just as Jesus experienced that rest, he now invites us to partake of that blessing of, of rest as well on the Sabbath. And so it says, God invites us to on the seventh day to put our work aside, our distractions, and to Focus on the most important things in life. But the blessing isn't to stop with us. Remember, this is a contagious blessing. It's meant to go on and on and on. In the next verse, um, Exodus, the next verse that goes on, it says this, On it you shall not do any work on the seventh day, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. So what this is saying is that the Sabbath is to flow on for us. All of us at times find ourselves in positions of influence. We might be an employer, we, it might be a parent with influence over kids, we might be paying someone to do something, and we're in those situations, we have influence over other people. But what this is saying is that the, the, the gift of rest that is there in the Sabbath is not just for us to receive, but we also are to give it to those people who are in our, in our influence as well. Is that the, so, so here we go. So the Sabbath is a day... So the Sabbath was blessed. It's a day to receive blessing. Uh, it's, sorry, it's a day to receive rest. So the blessing is to flow onto us. But it's also a day to give rest as well. That, that blessing is to, to be contagious and follow on. Um, now let me give you an example of giving rest. Okay? And I'm going to look at the, the life of Jesus. Now in the life of Jesus... There's, there's lots of stories where Jesus is, is giving rest on the Sabbath day. And um, one of the ways that Jesus gave rest was through healing people. Okay? But a lot of people were objected to Jesus healing people. And I'll give you, I'll give you the example there. Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 to 10, it says, Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue. Now, synagogue is, 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 is kind of similar to what we have called a church today. It's the Jewish version of closest thing at the time to a church back then. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. Now, the interesting thing, if you read the chapter before this, this is taking place on the Sabbath 
the Sabbath day. Um, looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Okay, now why would it be a bad thing to heal someone on the Sabbath? Well, people might think that that's, some, that, that's doing work. Okay? But remember that the Sabbath is a day to receive rest, but also a day to give rest. And what does it look to, like to give rest when we are confronted with suffering and, and the needs of people around us? Well, Jesus has this to say. He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. When, and then the story goes on that, that Jesus heals this person from, from his shriveled um, his illness on the day. And so what Jesus do is, I've got here, the Sabbath is a day for bringing the gift of rest to those who are suffering. Can you imagine what would the world would be like if everyone took a day out of, their, out of their week in order to focus on how they can bring rest to the suffering of those people around them? You can imagine our world would just be such a, a fantastic place if people actually did that. Now, I want to, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, uh, there's this beautiful verse that says, The thief comes, that's talking about Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, Jesus says, that they may have life and have it to the full. The Sabbath is all about experiencing life to the full. So the Sabbath is a rest day when God puts all of his things, his stuff aside and in order to give us his undivided attention. Uh, and he invites us to do the same in return. And the Sabbath is a blessed day, but we are to experience the rest, the blessing of rest, and we are to give the blessing of rest to others as well. Uh, number three is the Sabbath is a holy day. Now what does it mean... Of what makes something holy? In the Bible, it, it talks about um, God being holy. It talks about angels being holy. It talks about in sections people, certain people being holy. But it's, it's, it's a much rarer thing for some thing to be described as holy in the Bible. And what does it actually mean for some thing to be made holy? And what would make it, make it holy? One of the best examples I've found in, in the Bible where some thing is made holy is, is again in the book of Exodus. Now, in the book of Exodus, we encounter this man by the name of Moses. Okay? And Moses is a shepherd, and he's at this stage in his life, and he's, and he's looking after his sheep, and he's, and he's taking his sheep from trying to find grass for them to eat through this wilderness, wilderness area. And as he's doing so, God shows up to Moses in a very incredible way. And the, and the story is known as the story of the burning bush. Okay? And Moses looks up, and he sees this tree, and it's on fire. But the tree isn't burning up, and he's like, what is going on here? And what actually is going on is God is about to meet with Moses, and he's, and he's coming in, in the midst of this burning bush. Okay? And so the story goes, it says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. So here we see dirt being holy. Okay? Now, I suspect that that dirt looked like any other dirt. It probably felt like any other dirt. But it says that the dirt was holy. What made the dirt holy? Well, the conclusion that seems to be inescapable when you read through the story is it's the presence of God that makes the, the ground holy. And as you read through the Bible, whenever you see something is made holy... Um, in all the occasions I could find when I, read, when I looked them up, God's presence makes things holy. When God comes to meet with us, the, 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 the location becomes, becomes holy. And so when we talk about the Sabbath, it's the presence of God that is making the day holy. I want to show you something really cool about um, the way that God created the world. Back to um, our account of the six days of creation. When you look at the, the way in which God created the world, you'll see a pattern that takes place. First, God creates a space, then he fills that space. Okay? Then he creates another space and he, and he fills it. And, he, and he, he, he creates, the pattern is he's creating spaces and then filling those spaces. And let me show you how he does this. So in day one, we see God creates the heavens and the earth and day and night, and then he fills that space. 
He fills the day with the sun and he fills the night with the moon and the stars. On day two, he creates the sky and the ocean and he fills it with the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea. On this third day, God creates the land and the vegetation and then he fills it with, with the animals and with people. But when we come to day seven, we see God once again creating a space. Okay? But it's not a geographical space this time. It, it's, a, it's a space in time. Okay? But what does he fill it with? He fills it with himself. He makes it holy. God's presence shows up and, and the day is, becomes a holy day. So, so here's some, some things to help you understand that the meaning of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a rest day. It's where God put, gives us his undivided attention. It's a blessed day. It's, it's, a, it's a fountain of blessing that's to make our lives better. It's a day of receiving rest and giving rest as well. But it's also a holy day, a day where God enters into creation. He fills it with himself. Um, and it's a day for us to connect with, with God's presence. So before we finish, I just want to go through um, a series of just some common practical questions that people often ask about the Sabbath. Okay? This is sort of looking at the, the why of the Sabbath and the meaning of the Sabbath. Now we'll sort of look at a bit more at the, the how of the Sabbath. Okay? So the first question is this. Um, which day is the seventh day? Okay? Now when... You read through the Bible. The Bible doesn't describe um, days like we do in it, like today. You don't see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You don't see those names of days in the Bible. But the Bible simply names, numbers the days of the week. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? And, um, but when you look at, even just look at a regular calendar, you can see that the seventh day is Saturday. Okay? Some calendars these days... Um, to just make it easier for planning your week, they might group the whole weekend together. But on a regular calendar, you'll see that Saturday is the seventh, seventh day. Um, so the seventh day is, is Saturday. I'll give you a couple other sort of things to show this as well. Um, now, Jesus kept the, the Sabbath. Okay, we've, we've read about Jesus keeping the Sabbath. And at that time, the Jewish nation was keeping the Sabbath. And from that day right through until... Um, our day today, there's been a whole group, a nation of Jews all around the world that have been remembering to keep the seventh day, the uh, seventh day as the Sabbath, and they keep Saturday. You go to Israel today and you're on a Saturday, and you'll see them, Jews there, keeping the Sabbath. And you might think, well, maybe they've lost count some way, somewhere along the way. But because there's so many people keeping it, um, it's kind of like you can imagine the country of Australia suddenly forgetting what day of the week it is. When there's that many people counting, you don't lose count, if that makes sense. Um, and so, so our calendars show that the seventh day is, is, is Saturday. Um, the Jewish nation, following on from the example of Jesus, shows that the seventh day is Saturday. Um, but you might be wondering why uh, a lot of people th think that maybe... Why, why do so many people go to church on... A Sunday then, okay? And the interesting thing is that the, the majority of Christians, they don't go to church on a Sunday because they think that, um, that Sunday is actually the seventh day of the week, but they do it because they, they do it to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday, okay? The first day of the week, Jesus rose, and therefore a lot of people uh, use that, celebrate the first day of the week kind of like a, a Sabbath, uh, in, in remembrance of the, the resurrection of Jesus. But it's very interesting that when you look at the actual uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, um, we actually see an affirmation, not now that, that Sunday is, is a new day of worship, but rather that Saturday, Jesus still treats that as, as a day of rest. And I'll show you how we see that. If you just think about your usual Easter weekend, okay, we have Good Friday, Okay, and we call it Good Friday because that's the day when um, Jesus died upon the cross. Then we have uh, Easter Saturday, and there's not much that happens then. That's when Jesus was resting in the tomb. And then we have Easter Sunday, and we call it that because that's when Jesus rose to life once again. But let me read you a very interesting passage in the book of Luke. 
it says, uh, this is describing that, that actual, those days. It says, it was preparation day. Okay, that's the day where you prepare for the Sabbath. You do all the work you need to do so you can actually rest on the Sabbath day. Um, and this is, just, uh, this is the day when Jesus died here. It was preparation day. And the Sabbath was about to begin. The, woman who, the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then it says, Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Okay? Then it goes on to the, the next verse says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away in the tomb, uh, away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So what we see taking place here, um, Good Friday, when Jesus died, is described as preparation day. Okay, that's the sixth day of the week. Um, then on the Sabbath day, the women rested. And notice that Jesus is actually resting in the tomb on this day. And then on Sunday is the first day of the week when Jesus is, uh, rises from the dead. And so it's very interesting that this, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is not an initiation of a new day of worship, but rather we see Jesus even kept the Sabbath as he rested in the tomb. Okay? So it's a, it's a great affirmation that this is, is, is the Sabbath day, it's the rest day, it is Saturday. So that's question number one. Question number two, um, when does the Sabbath begin and end? Now, in modern days, day, uh, like um, today is a uh, Wednesday, and we'll switch over to Thursday when it hits midnight. Okay? But you have to remember that back in, in, in ancient times, um, they didn't have clocks, they didn't have watches, and so it's a very strange, th it's, it wouldn't make any sense to have a day begin at midnight, okay, before the, the, the arrival of, of clocks and watches. And so what the ancient people used to do was they would actually begin days when the sun, uh, when the sun sets. Okay? It's a much more consistent way of, of, of knowing when a day begins and when a day, day finishes. Let me give you a little example of this. Um, in this verse we're about to read, we're going to see a whole bunch of people bring people to Jesus to heal. Now because a lot of people had been discouraging Jesus from healing people on the Sabbath, they were afraid to bring these people to Jesus until the Sabbath days, the Sabbath hours were finished. And it goes on to say, At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. So as the sun went down, okay, the Sabbath hours began, and people brought their sick uh, to Jesus. Now we know that Jesus would have healed them before that, but in their thinking they had to wait until the Sabbath hours were finished. And so Sabbath is from Friday night at sunset and it extends through to Saturday at sunset. Okay? Next question. Isn't the Sabbath a Jewish day? Okay, a lot of people um, view the Sabbath as simply another, another it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a day of celebration that was for the Jewish nation only. And now that we're in the New Testament times, Christian, the Christian era, um, that has been pushed aside. However, um, there's a few things I want to show you that show that the Sabbath is, is, is not a Jewish day, but it's a day that God intended to be experienced and celebrated by, by everyone. Okay? Um, the first line of evidence is that the Jews didn't... There was never a Jew before um, Abraham. Okay? The, the Jewish nation is the, the descendants of Abraham. And Abraham lived about 2000 uh, BC, but the Sabbath existed before there was ever a Jew. Okay, and we've already read this, that the Sabbath goes back not to the Jewish nation, but it goes all the way back to Genesis. Before sin was even in the world, God intended that this, this whole planet to be enjoying a Sabbath day's rest. And so uh, the Sabbath isn't a Jewish day because it, was, it predates the Jewish nation. Another thing, when we looked at the Ten Commandments, and we talked about the Sabbath, it said, remember the Sabbath day. Okay? When you say remember, you're not, starting some, you're not initiating something new, but you're asking people to cast their mind back to something that they already know about. So, so God is saying, remember the Sabbath day. Remember that thing that was initiated right back in creation. I want you to continue observing that. It's not a Jewish day. It's a day for all, uh, all, of, all people. And then Jesus has this to say about the Sabbath. It says, And he said to them, 
The Sabbath was made for men. Okay, that doesn't just mean men as opposed to women, but uh, mankind is what it is collectively is describing there. It doesn't say the Sabbath was made for the Jews, it was made for all of mankind, not men for the Sabbath. And I would like to suggest to you that in our fast-paced world, where, think, where, we're, where the pressures of life are making us get busier and busier and busier and busier, a Sabbath is more relevant today than it has ever been in all of Earth's history. Next question. Does it really matter which day? Now, I've had people ask me this. Um, okay, I can, people say, I can see that it's important to have a day of rest, but do I have to rest on the specific day that God asks us to, or should I just choose one in seven to rest? Um, that might be easy with, with certain people's um, schedules and the like. Well, I think that that would be a... It wouldn't matter if, if the Sabbath rest was just for our physical rest. I would say it probably doesn't matter. But as we've looked at, the Sabbath is, mu- is about much more than just our physical rest. It's a day that, that God has taken the initiative to specifically bless and to specifically make holy with his presence. And, and it's for us to acknowledge that which, which God has, has done. Let me cast your mind back to the burning bush. You can imagine God speaking to Moses from the burning bush saying, Moses, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And you can imagine Moses saying, God, I understand that I need to take my shoes off with the dirt, but you know what, the dirt over here looks just like the dirt over there. Maybe I should just take my my shoes off when I'm over at the dirt over here because it looks the same, it feels the same. And we can see that that God probably wouldn't have accepted that in that moment because that's where God's presence, that's the specific day that God had um, had sectioned off for, for, for the feeling, for meeting with, with people. And you might say, well, isn't everything holy? Because God's presence is everywhere, isn't it? But in that burning bush, God had revealed his presence in a special way for the meeting between God and and Moses. Yes, God is everywhere in a general way, but in a special way, God was there to meet with Moses. And yes, we can connect with God every day of the week. God is present in every day of the week. But it is the seventh day that God has specifically blessed, that he is specifically made holy, and that he is specifically set aside for him to meet with us on that day. Um, final question. Why should I keep the Sabbath? Okay, we've already looked at this, but I just want to reiterate a couple of things. We should keep the Sabbath because God wants us to experience his rest. Remember that peace that surpasses all understanding? In this fast-paced world, God is inviting us into an experience of rest. God wants us to take the time to put our priorities straight, to focus on the most important things. I like to suggest some of these things that we see on the screen here. God wants us, we should keep the Sabbath so we can have that weekly reminder to, to prioritize our health. Okay? To take that time of, of, of a rest, to, to recharge and be rejuvenated for the, the week to come. To, to engage, to prioritize relationships, to spend time with, with, with our spouse, to spend time with our friends, to spend time with our family, to give those people we love our undivided attention. And it's also a day to engage to, to, to focus on our spiritual life. It's a, God, it's a day where we can um, to connect uh, in, with God's presence and to really focus and prioritize God. On the Sabbath day, God gifts us with his undivided attention and he invites us to do that to him in response, response as well. So, there's our uh, first session for tonight, the gifts of rest, um, the gift of prayer. I don't know what your, your prayer life is, is like, but I encourage you to take hold of that peace that God wants to give you by um, being more regular and engaging in prayer. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the second session. And then secondly, the Sabbath. I don't know if Sabbath is something, it might be a new concept to you at all, but I invite you to, 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 to continue learning about the Sabbath and to to take hold of the, the blessing that God wants to give to us through the Sabbath day. Thank you.